Welcome back to Yahushua's Commandments Expound. And as you heard me say priorly, I'm going to say again, this is one of the most important lessons in all of Scripture. For this teaches us the teachings and instructions of our Messiah. Whereas he told us if we love him, we would do. And that those that done so are fat those who love, who love him. And vice versa, those who don't do him are those who do <coughs> not love him. You know, so that being said, this truly is one of the greatest lessons in scripture because without doing these things, You're not going to get into the kingdom of Elohim. They need to be done. Because if you don't abide in the branch, even as Messiah taught, if you don't abide in the branch, then the husbandman of the branch, the Heavenly Father, will cut you away and throw you to the side for you to wither and die. So we want to stay connected. We want to stay in the vine, amen? Yes. You know, so we want to learn these, these commandments of Yahushua, and we want to learn to do them and apply them to our lives. Now, I'm going to tell you ahead of time that many of them are very difficult, if not impossible in some, some cases, you know, seemingly to do in the flesh. That's why we're not called to walk in the flesh. We're called to walk in the spirit. You know, we're called to be father from above, i.e. born again. And in doing so, and being so, we become spiritual beings. And there's no problem for spiritual beings to walk in the spirit, just as there's no problem for physical beings to walk in the physical. Amen? Amen. So, that being said, we're going to continue our study with Yahushua's commandments. We're just going to jump right on in. We left off number 61. And it's taken from Matthew, Yahoo, chapter 19, verse 12. It reads, it says, If one is able to be abstinent for the kingdom of Elohim, then do so. And if not, then thee is better off married. You know, so even as Paul would teach, you don't want anyone to burn with lust. So, you know, you're not able to do it, do so, then get married. But if you are, then stay abstinent for the king. Verse 60, uh, number 62, taken from Matthew Yahoo 19:21. Sell all that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and follow Yahushua in order for you to be perfect. You know, we're to be ready and willing to give all that we possess, any and everything, in order to be perfect. Now that perfect there doesn't mean perfect as in without error. Yeah. You know, the word perfect means complete. There was no one without error except for the Messiah, and there was right. no one else will be without error. Mm -hmm. oh, but you can't be complete. And this is what he's he's calling us to be. You know, in return, you'll receive a hundredfold of what you gave here in the kingdoms of this world. You'll receive a hundredfold in the kingdom of, of Hashemayim, or the kingdom of Elohim. We read in Matthew Yahoo 19, 27 through 29. Now, I'm a sorry, speaking to this. Can I first read to read Matthew Yahoo 19, 27 through 29? Then Peter answered and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Yeshua said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in his throne of his glory, he also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. 
and everyone that had forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wives, or children, or land, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Okay, so we see the Messiah <coughs> speaking to this. You know, we see Kephas saying, you know, they had forsaken all. You know, it's not just forsake all, but it's forsake all and follow Yahushua. And that's what they had done. They had forsaken all, and they had followed him. And he's just asking the question, what shall we have there for? And, and Messiah, you know, is telling them, you know, everyone that forsake houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for his name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit everlasting life. You know, there are some blessings that come upon us, you know, in the physical realm as well, you know, when we follow the other You know, it's not all just in the spiritual realm. You know, he blesses us here as well. You know, if we really adhere to his word, his word is complete. The plan is complete. It will teach us to have a peaceful and prosperous life here on earth as well as a peaceful and prosperous life in the hereafter. You know, it's all entailed in his words, all entailed in the wonderful plan that he has for those that adhere to him. Number 63, taken from Matthew Yahoo, chapter 20, verses 20 through 27, serve one another. Let me have my next uh, reader read Matthew Yahoo, chapter 20, verses 25 through 27. But Yahushua called unto them, unto him, and said, You know that the princes of, of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them and that they are great exercise authority, authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Okay. This word minister here that we see in verse 26 is diakonos, number 1249 being an attendant or waiter. You know, and... The word servant, we see in verse 27, is doulos. Doulos, number 1401, meaning a slave. You know, so what Yahushua is saying, he's saying, if you want to be great in the kingdom of Elohim, then you need to become, uh, you need to become a slave. The greatest in the kingdom of Elohim would have been the greatest slave to the kingdom. You know, if, if you want to be great amongst the ecclesia, then, you know, you need to serve the ecclesia. You need to become an attendant, a waiter unto them. You know, you need to attend and wait on the body you know, if you want to be great. You know, so things are a little different in the kingdom of Elohim than they are in the kingdoms of this world. You know, for as the Messiah is saying, he said, you know that the princes, the rulers of the Gentiles, the rulers of, of the people of the world, they exercise dominion over them. You know, the rulers, they get in, they get in these ruling positions and they exercise dominion. They rule over. They exercise authority over. See, but our positions in the kingdom of Elohim are what you call titular. They're just a name only. You know, you don't really have any authority over anyone. The Messiah is the only one that has the authority. You know, our job is to serve. You know, and the greater your servitude in the flesh, the more prominent your position will be in the spiritual kingdom of Elohim. You know, I don't know about nobody else, but I strive for the prize of the high call. So, I'm getting my serve on every chance I get. You know, I, I'm, I'm bending over backwards. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to 
serve till I can't serve no more. <laughs> and anyone who want to be great in the kingdom, you know, this is how it's done. Now, you know, some people, they don't mind. They just, you know, as long as they make it in, even if it's by the skin of their teeth, they're good. Hey, you in. You know, I, I'm not mad at you. At least you in. You know, but, you know, I, for those of us who want to strive for the high, call it a high prize, then, you know, find a way to serve and get to, get to serving. Because that's how you're going to get that high prize. Number 64, taken from Matthew Yahoo 23, verses 2 and 3. Do what the scribes and Pharisees say, but not as they do, for they sit in the seat of Moshe. We have our next reader read, Matthew Yahoo 23, <laughs> 2 through 7, please. He's saying, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, okay. <laughs> saying the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moshe's seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe that observe, observe that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous, and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms of feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Yes, 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 yes. You know, do as they say, but not as they do. You know, they, they love the recognition of men. They love to be recognized and, and honored amongst men. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees held the seat of Moshe, not as mediators between betwixt Israel and Elohim, but as expositors, expositors of Torah, that is, the teachings and instructions of Elohim given to Moshe. You know, uh, with Torah being a municipal law of their state, they were as judges, or if you would, a panel of judges. You know, they used to have the Sadducees, there used to be a panel of them, and, and whenever there was a, an issue, they had come before them, and they would judge the matter based upon Torah. Supposedly, it was supposed to be based upon Torah. Now, as we seen with the Messiah, they didn't quite, you know, stick to the rules. You know, so we see that they bent them some at times you know but this is what the messiah is calling them on and he's saying you know they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born see they made torah they made it heavy they made it burdensome they made it you know just about impossible for someone to actually keep you know and y'all wasn't pleased with this you know not only did they make it grievous and, and heavy you know they wouldn't do it they didn't even do it. You know, so they were, the, they were hypocrites of the worst kind. You know, here it is, they were purporting that, you know, you're to do this, that, and the other, but yet they wouldn't even do it themselves. And here it is, they're, they're uh, judging people and sentencing people to punishment and even death for things that they weren't even doing themselves and wouldn't do. Refused to do it. You know, so, you know, this is, this is real, was really, really bad in the eyes of Yah. And he's, he's saying, you know, that those who, the ecclesia, those who rule over the kingdom of Elohim are not to do such things. They're not to be hypocrites. As a matter of fact, to ensure that this wouldn't happen, you know, he just gave them positions that was titular, that was in name only. You didn't actually have no authority, you know. I don't have no authority over anyone. I don't have any authority over anyone. You know, the only authority that I have is in name only. You know, what has the authority is the word of Elohim. And I'm a servant 
And I point people to that word of Elohim. You know, so that's what I do. You know, it's not, yeah, I'm a pastor, but I don't have any authority. I don't have any authority over anyone's life. I just simply tell you what the words say. That's the authority. Whether you recognize it or not, that's between you and the authority. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to be showing up at your house and telling you know, hey, it's it's, it's Sabbath. You know, why you know, why you not um, at church? Come on, ride with me. No, it's not that type of party. I'm not. You know, that's that's not my job. I stay in my lane. You know, my job is to serve. And as I said, I've been over backwards trying to do that. You know, because I want to be great in the kingdom. I'm striving for the prize. Call it a high prize, you know. So I'm just trying to get my serve on. I'm doing my job. I have a goal in mind. I plan on reaching it. You know, so but these men, they wouldn't they were doing something quite different. They was telling people to do stuff that they wouldn't even do themselves. Now, concerning the seat of Moshe, it was customary for the scribes and Pharisees to stand when reading Yah's law. But they would sit when they began to expound on it. For to show that Elohim's word was always over man's fallible interpretations. You know, so even though they they sat in they sat in that seat, you know, Yah was he's telling them, don't do as they do. Do what the words say. When they speak to you what was in Torah, what Moshe received from Elohim, yeah, that's that's what you do, but you know, don't do as they do. Uh, number sixty-five. Be not ye called rabbi. Wait a minute, that's one of the things that they love that they love, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We see in Matthew Yahoo 23, and greetings. <laughs> In the markets, you know, this is it says they love the uppermost rooms at the feast. You know, they want to be at the forefront, the chief seats in the synagogues, and the greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi. You know, but here it is in, in number sixty-five. You know, Yahushua is teaching us: be not called, be ye not called, be not ye called rabbi. You know, and it amazes me that. You know, people come into this, come into this walk, and you know, and they insist on being called rabbi. You know, when it says right here in Matthew Yahoo twenty three eight, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Messiah, and all ye are brethren. You know, and when you, when you ask, you know, you know, why? Why do you want to be called rabbi? You know, they say, oh, it just means teacher. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the answers that I, I, I have all the time to see. You know, but right here, when we, when we look at this command that the Messiah gave, in Matthew Yahoo 23, 8, it says, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Messiah, and all ye are brethren. So he's liking being called rabbi to master. And that doesn't sound like teacher to me, but I, I could have been mistaken, so I looked it up. Mm -hmm. And the word was rabbi, number 4461, and guess what it meant? My master. Hmm. But then I looked elsewhere in scripture, you know, because, you know, let every matter be established out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Amen? Amen. Yoganah 138 says, Then Yahushua turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi. And then Yochanan, he interprets it for you. Right in the text. It says in parentheses, which is to say being interpreted. Teacher? No. Master. Where dwellest thou? And this is the same number, the same word, same Strong's number, 4461. Also, in Mark 14, 44, and 45 says, and he that betrayed him had given them a token saying, whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goes straightway to him and say, master, master, and kissed him. And of course, this is Yah, um, Yahudah or Judah 
you know, when he was betraying the Messiah. And he was calling him master again. This, these words, master, master, is actually number 4461, rabbi, rabbi. And we see they're just straight up translated as master right there. So, make no mistake about it. Rabbi meant master. And it means master. It doesn't mean teacher. You know, and Yahushua taught us, he taught us, be not ye called rabbi. You know, and I've had, you know, a number of people ask me, you know, why you, know, why you don't want to be called rabbi? Well, this is why. <laughs> because I'm no one's master. You know, and Messiah, he clearly says not to do it. You know, so with that in mind, call no man rabbi. I don't care if they look like this. <laughs> yeah, even if they look like this and they got their phylacteries on their arm and on their head and, mm. you know, and they rocking their prayer shawl, you know, don't do it. Don't call no man rabbi. I don't care if they're messianic, if you would, or however they try to term it. You know, follow the teachings and instructions of our Messiah. If they're truly messianic, then they wouldn't be calling themselves rabbi, now would they? I mean, I'm just saying. Number... Oh, yeah, 66. Taken from Matthew Yahoo 23, 9. Call no man upon the earth your father. You know, so again, this is likened unto call no man rabbi. You know, because back in those times, they used to call the rabbi's father, too. You know, and this is kind of where, this is where they got the thing for the Catholic priest. You know, they got to call him the father. So I don't care, you know, he looks like this. And, and, you know, he has this little light showing right there. You know, call no man father. And, and I, I was just looking at these, and it was kind of interesting because, you know, normally when you see the rabbis, they have them all black. You know, and the Catholic priest, they also wear all black. Mm -hmm. Well, a little bit of white. <clears throat> you know, why would you want to <coughs> your, your your routine garb to be to be showing that you're covered with darkness mm. with a little light? Mm -hmm. You know, I call your attention to that because things matter. Everything means something. You know, whether you understand what they mean or not, everything means something. You know, they don't just wear all black for nothing. You know, there's a reason why. Why not yellow? Why not white? Why not blue? Why not purple? Why not multicolored? There's a reason why. There's a reason for everything. See, and you have to retrain your minds to look for those reasons why and try to relate everything that you do back to Yah. You know, because if we're going to be of him following in him, you know, and he's the word of Elohim, so say of John 1 and 1, right? The beginning was the word, the word was with Elohim, the word was Elohim. You know, then, you know, if we're going to be walking in him and following after him, then I mean we're going to be walking in the word and following after what the word say, right? Yeah. You know, so have a scriptural reason for the things that you say and do. Mm. See, a lot of people, they just do stuff because other people are doing it. Mm -hmm. That's not the reason to do things. That's what gets you in trouble. Now, number 67 is likened unto the last two. Matthew Yahoo 23.10 says, Neither be ye called masters. You know, now he's just, you know, just straight out. Don't be called masters. You know, and you don't want to, 
you don't want to um, get caught up into this, you know. In other words, he's letting you know that you only have one authority on this planet. Mm -hmm. That's what he's trying to tell you. You only have one authority, and that authority is the Most High El. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, he's coming from the same place that that um, Yah was coming from when he said, Thou shalt have no other Elohim before me. Mm -hmm. For you only have one judge, and that's Elohim. Mm -hmm. You know, so neither be ye called master. <clears throat> so I don't care. <laughs> You know, if you 15th degree black belt and, you know, and, and, and you go before him and he insists on you calling him master, I suggest you find another teacher. <laughs> don't, don't get him upset, though. I don't want you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> he gonna look like he's playing. <laughs> You know, so just, just keep that in mind. You know, the word should be the authority in your life. In all facets. You know, this is what you should be ascribing to be. This is what everybody in the body of Messiah should be ascribing to be. A humble servant. Trying to see what they can do for the kingdom of Elohim and for the citizens thereof. Now this is our call. Now, number, <coughs> which one is it? Should be 68? All right, uh, passed over down the guy account. Uh, just be trying to remember the word so much, you know. Who needs coming? <laughs> Number 68, Luke 12, 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. You know, now, many of the clergy of the past, as well as most that exist today, are seeking to convert people over to, quote, unquote, Christianity. And they've been highly successful, on the most part. But there are over 2 billion Christians in the world today. There's only six billion people on the planet. You know, so that's amounting just over a third of the world's population, thereby making it the number one religion within the world today. The big three is Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Now, if you ask any one of them if they're saved, that is saved from the second death via the lake of fire, you know, most of, and most if not all of them will answer with a resound, resounding yes, I am. Now, I'm going to, you know, reiterate one of the commandments of Yahshua. He says, take heed that no man can deceive you. These are the first words out of our Savior's mouth when his disciples asked him, about the sign of the second coming, you know, uh, which is taken from Matthew 24, 4. And he warned that many will be deceived. And 7, 14, he teaches us the way to life is a narrow one, which few find, <coughs> which is uh, the sister passage to this verse in Luke 12, 24. Now, if we believe scripture, we must realize that this means for us starting, for us start taking responsibility for ourselves. Um, we must realize what this means and start taking responsibility for ourselves. For if you're following the majority instead of the few, then you probably need to rethink your path. Because he says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. And he speaks of the few lead, being on the path leading unto life. So if you follow the majority instead of those few, then you probably need to rethink the pathway that you're taking. And the reason why is because we're called to walk in this narrow way that leads up unto life. And that narrow way 
will take you on a journey through the word of Elohim. There is no other way. You can't go outside of the word and get there. You have to go through the word of Elohim, which is to say you have to go through Yahshua, because he is the word of Elohim. In Matthew Yahoo 7, 14, we read, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few be that find. Now, I want you to really let these words resonate within you. He says, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And he says, few be that find it. Surely this word few can't mean what we think it means. Well, let's see. This word few is aglios, number 3641, meaning little or puny. Yeah, I'm afraid it does mean what we think it means. He's saying it's only a little or a puny amount of people that will find the way that leadeth unto life. That's saying something, is it not? <laughs> and the verse preceding it, Matthew Yahoo 7, 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in therein. And I should have put the definition for many, because it means mostly all. So I want you to really let that resonate with you for a second. The narrow way, there's only a few people that find it. There's only a few that find it. But here it is. We have over 2 billion Christians in a world population of 6 billion, making up a third of the population. Does that sound like the way of the many or the way of the few? Christianity make up the number one religion in the world. Does that sound like the way of the many or the way of the few? Well, here, 713, we learned that the way of the many leads to destruction. There's no doubt that Christianity as we know it today has become the way of the many. There's no way you can get around that. For as aforementioned, it's the, it's the number one religion in the world. You know, and that fact is quite troubling, to say the least, when you consider this verse, because it conflicts with Scripture. We can't have it both ways. We can't be living the way of the few and the way of the many simultaneously. Therefore, one is a fraud. And it's today's pseudo-Christianity. It's today's pseudo-Christianity that's the perpetrator. If one take an in-depth look at the way of the few that leads to eternal life that Yahushua, the Messiah taught, they find a vastly different way than the way of today's pseudo-Christianity, which is also said to lead to eternal life. You know, but it's obvious. One of them wrong. But how did it come to this? Well, in Yahoo 16, 19, we're taught, it says, O Yahuwah, my strength and my fortress and my refuge, in the day of affliction the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. In Mark 7, 13, Yahoo was speaking something similar, says, speaking of the uh, scribes and the Pharisees, saying, that they make the word of Elohim of none effect through their traditions, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. As we can see from the above verses, it was prophesied a long ago, Yermi who prophesied it long ago that lies, vanity, and things of no profit, such as useless traditions would be passed down. And that's just what happened during Yahshua's time. See, but I got news for you. It happened again. Yeah. It happened again after Yahshua's time, and that's where we are now today. Yeah. We're in the same situation and circumstance 
that the Messiah and the apostles were in. Once again, our fathers have inherited lives, vanity, and things wherein there is no problem. Once again, they are making the word of Elohim of none effect through their traditions. Mark 7, 7 through 9 says, How be it in vain do they worship me? Teaching for the doctrines of the commandments of men. That's what's going on today in modern day Christianity. A lot of the things that's being taught are simply the doctrines and commandments of men. You can't trace them back to scripture. You can't trace them back to Yah. He goes on to say, for laying aside the commandment of Elohim, ye hold the tradition of men. See, many of many other people, in order to keep these very same traditions that are worthless, they put aside the true commandments of Elohim. Now the Messiah says in verse 8, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. But today we can say, you know, as, you know, not keeping Shabbat, you know, because man said that you can do it on this day. You know, such as not keeping Yah's teachings and instructions because man said you don't have to. But what does it say that in the Word? Are we living in accordance to man or are we living in accordance to the Word? We have to get back to what the Word say. We have to get back to having scriptural reasons for what the things that we do. Verse 9, and he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of Elohim, that ye may keep your own tradition. And that's the same thing that's going on now today. People straight up rejecting the commandment of Elohim. So that they can keep man's tradition, so that they can do what other men are doing. Because, you know, that's what's being done today. You know, that's, that, well, that's, that's how it is now. No, it's not. That's not how Yah intended it to be. That's not what he laid his life down on the line for. You know, like we're going over Yahshua's commandments. You know, one of the greatest lessons in all of Scripture. Most people never even heard of Yahshua's commandments. Let alone look at them, study them, try to apply them to their lives. As we can see from the aforementioned verses, it was prophesied long ago that the lies and vanities and things of no profit, such as the traditions, would be passed down. It happened then, and it happened again. And we're in the same place now that the Messiah and the apostles were. Same type situation. With our faith being full of lies and traditions of men and things that's unprofitable. Luke 13, 23 says, this said one unto him, Adonai, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, before we go any further, let's make sure that word few is what we think it is. Few, ugly old, same word, number 3641. Yep, still means little and puny. And he said in verse 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Now, I want you to let that seek into your heart and mind because if he's saying many will seek to enter in. It's not because they're not trying to enter in. They're, they're, they're seeking to enter in, but they won't be able to. Well, why won't they be able to? Because they're on the wrong path. They're in the wrong way. They're doing things the world's way. They're doing things their way. But the only way you're going to get in is to start doing things Yah's way. You know, we see here, it says strive. What does he mean, what does he mean by strive? This word strive is agonizomai. Or agonizomai. Number 75 in the, in the Greek meaning to struggle, to fight, to labor fervently. You know, when the last time you were struggling to get into the kingdom of Elohim. That's not what's taught. Modern day Christianity says that you can just say a few words and believe in your heart and that's it. It's a wrap. 
I, I don't see no struggle in that. Where's the fight in that? Where's the fervent labor in that? See, now it's, it's our responsibility to sift out those lies and, and that vanity and those unprofitable things that we've inherited and get back to the unadulterated truth, yes. which is the word of Elohim. Mm -hmm. Not only for our sakes, but also for the sakes of our children and our yes. children's children. Yes. Somebody has to break the chain. Yes. Somebody got to put a stop to this madness. Yes. Somebody got to stand up mm -hmm. and proclaim the truth. Somebody gonna have to stand in the way. Somebody gonna have to get beat up on. All right. All right. It just is what it is. Yes, it is. I don't see nobody struggling to do nothing <laughs> except for getting the parking space so that they can get in. You know. Let me stop. <laughs> he says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. The reason that he's saying strive, the reason that he's, he's saying to struggle to fight the labor fervently is because it's not an easy task. Everything in the word, everything in the world, I should say, is set up against you entering in at that straight game. Okay. See, I want you to know and understand that. When you start trying to walk this thing out right, when you start trying to walk this thing out in accordance to scripture, then you're going to find the whole world is against you. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to say, man, how, is, how am I supposed to be able to do this? How, how, how can I do this in, in, in today's time? The same way they did back then. Right, right. You got to go against the world. That's right. You can't be with the world. Right. Mm. See, people just read right over those scriptures like, that, um, such as the one that says, those who are friends with the world are at enmity with Elohim. They just read right over that. Yeah. What does that mean? I don't know what they're talking about. Let me just keep it moving. If you're friends with the world, you're at enmity with Elohim. Yeah. See, those who are friends with the world, you know, the worldly way of Christianity, they don't have no problem fitting into the world. Mm. Right. They fit in like hand and glove. Mm. I don't see what the big deal is. See, they don't have no struggle. They don't have no fight. Mm. See, but you got to be struggling and fighting to get to this, this straight game. So, if your Christianity look like the other two billion, yeah. then you got a problem on your hand. Mm -hmm. That's just real. Mm -hmm. When you consider the verses, when you consider scripture, that's just real. Everything that scripture teach, modern day sense of Christianity, it just does not add up. You know, because when you look at it, the way that it's taught, you know, you don't see no striving, you don't see no struggling, no fighting, you know, you don't see none of this stuff. You don't, you don't see how few can be saved, you know, you know, like I say, you know, you ask any of that, any of those two billion people that accepted Messiah, you know, by confessing a few words and, and saying they believe and then going back to being happy heathens. You ask any of them, they're going to tell you the same thing. Yeah, I'm saved. I got news for you. You're not saved till you're saved. You know, and they keep it, keep it moving. Keep it moving. You know, somebody got to stand in the gap. Somebody got to, got to, uh, you know, dig and find the truth of the matter. You know, I guess I'm that somebody. You know, not because I chose to be, because he chose me to be. You know, but since he did, I'm going to do the best that I can. Yeah. You know, this stuff that's, that's being taught is wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at modern day Christianity, you know, you know they, they keep stuff like this, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> now what? I don't even see sweetest in the scripture. <laughs> the sweetest what? The sweetest day? Really? You know, what's that down there? What's that, some kind of little fairy or something? You know, I'm just being, I'm just being real. 
What does this have to do with Messiah? Yeah. What does this have to do with Elohim? Nothing. This not even kept it even everywhere in the country. Let alone, you know, I mean, but how you get wrapped up into this? See, this is some of those vain traditions. Yeah. You know, but you see it propagated even through Christianity, even through the churches. What about this one? Really? Now, you, you see churches bending over backwards trying to make this fit some kind of way. Yeah. Now, this this whole this whole festival is centered around death, demons, darkness, you know, dread. But yet, you have churches trying to figure out a way to fit it in to Christianity. And they done done it. We're not going to call it devil night. We're going to call it all saints night. I don't care what you call it. It's still the same thing. It's the same thing. This is a high day. But not for the followers of Elohim. It's a high day for the followers of Hasatan. This is their high day. This is one of their highest days. Really? You should be in the church on your face. Not talking about some trick or treat or giving away candy that's going to rot your kid's teeth out to begin with. Come on, we got to get these useless traditions, these, these vain practices back to the world. Our Christianity got to look a whole lot different than the world's. Check her out. She's flying on the moon. Yes. Really? This is what, you know, this is what we're doing, though, in the name of Christianity. You know, I mean, it's even in the church. You know, they, it's just not, you know, it's, this, is, this is just what the Messiah was saying. You know, now, they won't come out to worship and honor Yah, but they'll come out for this. For this special day, but they won't. They don't want to keep. You know, you start talking about you know Pesach or Passover or unleavened bread or Shavuot. You know, they don't even know what that is, even though it's in the word of Elohim. But they know what Halloween is. Come on, come on think about this. What about this one? Everyone's, everyone loves this. Yeah. You know, come on, everybody loves it. What's wrong with giving thanks on, uh, you know, what's wrong with giving thanks for some food? Nothing wrong with that, huh? Everybody loves to eat. <laughs> I love to eat. But the truth of the matter is, this is just as pagan as any of them. It's yeah. not as pagan, but it's pagan all the same. Mm -hmm. Don't get it twisted. It is pagan. You know, they first started doing it doing this, giving thanks, you know, to impress the Indians, yeah. you know, when they came to this country. Yeah. To impress the Indians and, and show them how mighty their weapons was so that they'd be scared and not attack them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's what, that's what this came about from. It wasn't, didn't have nothing to do with Yah. Yeah. You know, but people would break their neck, spend their last dime. So that they can have a Thanksgiving meal. We got to start doing things y'all like and stop doing things world like. You know, again, our Christianity can't look like the world's. We can't be the way of the few and the way of the many at the same time. You got to choose. You got to choose. You know, y'all gives us special days every week. And in real talk, if you add up all Yah's, all the scriptural feast days, his Moedim, not only are they his Moedim, see, you got a, you got a, uh, an incentive there 
to, to come and celebrate because they're his mordim, which means appointed times. These are the times in, in which they, he says he'll come and fellowship with us. You know, so you have an incentive to come and keep him because here it is, the Most High El himself says he's going to be there. You know, and if he got something to tell you, you know, it's, it's, it's a good time to get before him. You know, if he got something to tell you, it's a good time to get in his presence so that you can hear what he has to say. You know, so that's a reason to come. We have a special guest. You know, every Shabbat, we have a special guest today. And it's Elohim. All his Moedim, we have special a special guest that show up. You know, so that's reason to come on out. You know, but he's not at the um, Thanksgiving dinner table. He's not there. I'm, I'm sorry, you know. He's, he's, he just isn't. And what about this one? Y'all know I'm about to go ham, right? <laughs> It's just so much. This is just so pagan. It can't get no more pagan than this. And this is the this is the biggest one of them all. You know, this is this is the granddaddy of the pagan days. You know, of of uh, you know of modern day Christianity. This is a big day. You know, it's shameful. That's what it is. What about this character here? You see the wizard's hat? <coughs> you know, Yah doesn't have to do magic. Nope. Because he's supernatural. Right. You understand? Mm -hmm. When you're supernatural, you don't have to do magic. Mm -hmm. You just supernaturally do things. <laughs> you know, this guy right here, he was a wizard, you know. Mm -hmm. He's always trying to allure the, the kids with some candy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they wanna they wanna promote this as you know the Messiah's birthday. But any anybody who done do a half a study, you know, can see that it's not his birthday. You know, but here it is. They put their little wizard before us. What in the world do reindeer have to do with the Messiah? I mean, somebody tell me, please. What does that have to do with the word of Elohim? Nothing. Nothing. What is this? The tree? Nothing. But I'm going to tell you what it does have something to do with. And that's the festival of Saturnalia, which was a pagan festival that go way, 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 way back. You know, during the Roman Empire, you know, they celebrated the birth of Mithras, which was the, which was a sun god, mm. you know, and December twenty fifth is it was actually um, day after the winter solstice. It actually uh, they changed it to the twenty fifth. Used to be something like the twenty second, the uh, day after the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year. You know, was known as the sun's birthday because that's when the sun would begin to stay out longer and longer and longer. So it was a picture. of uh, the son being reborn and growing up, so to speak. And that's why it became known as the son's birthday, because it it literally was the son's birthday. S-U-N, not S-O-N of Elohim. You see what I'm saying? Big difference. You know, now, that's when it used to uh, happen. Many scholars believe that the Messiah's birthday was actually at the end of uh, September, late September, early October. And, you know, this was in honor of Saturnalia, you know, which was, in, which was uh, giving glory to the god of the planet Saturn, which, by the way, where you get Saturday from. You know, they they don't they didn't change a thing, you know. You look at this stuff and you see the roots of it, you know, and you say, well, you know, well, that's just the way it is today. No, it is the way it is today, but it's the same as the way it was yesterday. And y'all had a problem with it then and he has a problem with it now. 
You know, they used to celebrate this. You know, they used to um, give gifts to one another. They used to they used to do role playing games. Um, during this time, the masters used to uh, allow the servants to dress up in their clothes, and they would dress up in in, in lowly clothes, and like the servants, and they would trade places. You know, for a day. You know, not to mention, you know, they had all types of, uh, you know, uh, lasciviousness going on. You know, it was, uh, it was in honor of the sun god, which was a fertility, fertility, uh, fertility god. You know, so that's uh, really what it spoke to. You know, it was, uh, many of these pagan days go back to fertility gods. You know, which they which they worship. You know, Santa Claus. You know, he really didn't have anything to do with Saturnalia. He was an invention of Coca-Cola. You know, actually, you know, but still, he was a wizard. You know, that's why in the early days you see him doing magic. You know, and passing out candy and and, and all this type type of stuff. You know, but you know. And seeing that it was honoring a fertility God, you know, this, this high day of Christianity is all about fertility. You know, I'm speaking to the adults now. This is all about fertility. Y'all with me? Okay. These next slides, I want y'all to pay attention. I'm going to say some stuff without saying some stuff. You know? All right? Now, we know the wreath, Christmas wreath, is put on the door, right? You ever wonder why it's put on the door? Because they're worshiping a fertility god. You know, and it represents the door of the woman. Then we have the Christmas tree. Hey. The Christmas tree. <laughs> the Christmas tree represents the male phallic symbol. That's all this is. You know, the children of Yah, you know, the sign of the sign of the covenant of Abraham was circumcision. Mm -hmm. Well, those of the world kind of look like this. You know, and that's what this represents. Now, this is the high day of modern day Christianity. Even though Jeremiah chapter 10 says, Hear ye the word which Yahuwah speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith Yahuwah, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Signs of heaven. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cut of a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe, they deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Yahweh, thou art great, and thy name is great and mighty. Who would not fear thee, O king of the nations? For to thee doeth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock of the, the stock is a doctrine of vanities. 
you know, you have to understand what this stuff is and where it comes from. It has no place in our worship. None. You know, you know what this represents. So you can just use your imagination as to, you know, the bulbs and the, the I forgot what they call this stuff, but yeah. And the presents were put up under the tree because that was a sign of the offerings. It ain't too late, it's presence was put up on the bottom because those were the offerings unto the fertility God. You know, Ba'al, the sun God, was the male figure. We'll get to the female figure, you know, later of, of the fertility worship. Now, how do you get the tree in the house? You bring it through the door. What's on the door? And you got to bring the tree through the door. We know what the reef represent? What do you do under the mistletoe? This is all about fertility. You know, you have to understand this. You have to see this. You have to get this because it is, it's vulgar. Yes, I know it is. It's vulgar. But this is the high day of so-called Christianity. Mm. Mm. This don't have no place in y'all's word. Mm. Matter of fact, <laughs> Yermiyahu, Jeremiah chapter 10, speaks against the practice. Would you just try to tell your average Christian today that they shouldn't have a Christmas tree or they shouldn't have a wreath on their door or they shouldn't have no mistletoe. Hmm. They shouldn't put no gifts under the tree. Hmm. You talk about a fight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those same people that are supposed to be wise as serpents and gentle as a doves will be ready to black your eye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling the truth. Yeah. This stuff don't have no place mm -hmm. in our worship. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, I want you to consider the capital of our nation, the White House, during Christmas time, with their giant reef. Mm -hmm. You know, they do it big. This is their giant Christmas tree pulled by their giant Clydesdale horses. <laughs> I, you know, you, you, have to, you have to consider these things. This, this is not by happenstance. They got it all decked out now. And you know what they do up under the mistletoe, right? Yeah. Hey, that didn't work right. <laughs> I had another picture that popped up. You know, it was actually uh, Michelle and Obama kissing under the mistletoe. You know, but so much for that one. Then we come to New Year. Happy New Year. Nothing about this is scriptural. First of all, it's not the New Year. You know, it's an, it's an extension. It's actually the, it's actually the, the end of Saturnalia. You know, that, you ever heard the, um, the um, song, 12 Days of Christmas? That's what they're counting down to. New Year. Nothing new about it. They've been keeping this for hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years. The same thing with Saturnalia. You see, we're reading about it in, in, in Yermiyahu and Jeremiah. 
You know, now there's people who will tell you that, well, it doesn't say, don't say Christmas tree. No, I don't say Christmas tree. Because Christmas wasn't invented then. The Messiah hadn't even come. So how are you going to have anything called Christmas or Christos or any of that? He hadn't even came. But use your common sense. Okay, don't call it a Christmas tree. Just don't, just, just do what it say. Don't cut down no tree. Don't bring it in your house. Don't set it up right. Don't deck it with silver and gold. And see you still keep Christmas in that manner. You can't do it. So it, you don't, you know, you don't have to call it that. That's what it is. By the mere definition. And the culmination of it was New Year's. You know, this was to mark the beginning of the month of um, the first month, which is uh, on the Gregorian, on the world's calendar, they call January. It was in honor of a pagan god, of course, you know, called Janus. Janus was the roaming god of the doors and gates. And he had two faces, one looking forward and one looking back. The largest insurance company in the world is called Janice King. And that's their symbol. Think that's just coincidence? Everybody knows this stuff except for those who need to know. The powers that be, the 1% or 5% that's ruling over the 95%, they know. The 1% of, of those who are trying to walk this thing in scripture out, they know. But the masses, they dumb as a box of rocks when it comes to this stuff. Right. Why do you think they call the first day of the week Sunday? In honor of their sun God. They call the second day Moon Day, which became Monday, in honor of the fertility goddess, which was supposed to be the wife of the sun God. Same thing with Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it's all pagan. It's all pagan. You know, they used to have all type of, uh, in all these, you know, pagan days, these pagan high days, they, they used to have all types of orgies and, and, and different, you know, things in conjunction with fertility, right. you know, and even sometimes they even, you know, forced people to participate. You know, on Halloween, they used to actually sacrifice people. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, that was how they really worshipped that. That's what the jack-o'-lantern um, typified. It typified, you know, those hollow places that in the trees that they used to carve out and they used to put people in and set them on fire alive. That's why you have a face on the pumpkin to symbolize that hollowed out tree that they used to use, they used to use the oak tree. They used to hollow it out and then they'll carve a face into it and they'll put the people in there and they'll set them on fire. That's what your, that's what your jack-o'-lantern is. You know, to appease the spirits that would come through the, uh, the portals during that night because that was, the, that was the high day in which they were most susceptible to come in. So to appease them, they offered them them sacrifices. They did the same thing on Saturnalia. You know, just in a different fashion. But they did human sacrifices then as well. So you have to understand the origins of these things. They don't have no place in your worship. Yah is not connected with these things. What about this one? You know, look real cute, don't it? But this is actually a pagan god. You know, that's Cupid. I think Romans called him Pan, as in Peter Pan. And, you know, he was normally naked. That's why they always present him as a little boy. He was a grown man. 
flying around naked. <laughs> I'm just saying, you need to know where this stuff comes from. You know, you need to know where this stuff comes from. You know, he was known to be uh, a god of fertility. He was the protector of the herbs and the crops. And he was considered a mighty hunter. That's why, that's the real reason he has this bow in his hand. It wasn't to make nobody fall in love. You know, they, he was believed to protect them from the wolves that used to attack the herds and the crops and the people. So they used to pray to him. You know, of course, they sacrificed to him as well. You know, but during his festival, it wasn't unlike any other others. They had the same old lasciviousness taking place, you know. All this stuff goes back to fertility. It all goes back to sex. You know, that's, that's, that's all it is. What about this one? Yeah, 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 that one too. You know, now when you think about it, it don't make sense to begin with. First of all, bunny rabbits don't lay eggs. They mammals. They give birth like, like dogs, you know. But they're known for their multiplication. They're known for giving birth yeah. to a whole lot of yeah. babies. Yes. Yeah. Hence, they are symbol of fertility. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Likewise with the egg. It's easy to make a connection with the oh, egg. Yeah. Yeah. And Ishtar, Easter comes from the word Ishtar, which was a pagan goddess. You know, in, in the scriptures, she's known as Astra. And when you read about all those high places and those groves, when you're reading through through the Old Testament and you hear all this talk about in the high places and the groves, and you just hear them going on and on and on and on about these things. This is who they were worshiping. Astra or Ishtar. She was the head goddess over Babylon and Nineveh. She had really had to, um, can be attributed to her the first money system. Her symbol was the owl. So on the back of the dollar bill, if you look carefully, you'll find a little owl over in the upper right hand corner. You know, these things aren't by happenstance. They haven't gotten entwined into society as a fluke. They haven't gotten sown into Christianity arbitrarily. These things was purposely done. You know, Constantine was said to accept the Messiah on his deathbed. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But I know from history that he was fighting the people of Messiah all the days of his life mm -hmm. while he was in rule up until that time, right before he died. Fervently. He oppressed them fervently. Now this is just supposition on my part. But I believe that he got to the point where he said, whoa, I'm going about this all wrong. I know how to get them. Can't beat them, join them. So he said, I'll become a Christian, and I'll infiltrate them and poison them from the inside out. Because when you look, you see, that's when all this stuff crept into, into the faith. And from that point, they began to blend sun worship with following the Messiah. You know, and that's how you got all this stuff into the faith. And then the ones who opposed it, 
who were the true followers of Messiah, they annihilated. Yeah. And then they made everybody believe, um, everybody be Christian because it was it was the the national religion. And they put the Roman Catholic Church head over the Roman Empire, which was head over the world. And they literally persecuted anyone who refused to become a Christian. And they killed many, 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 many thousands upon thousands of people in the name of Christianity. <clears throat> which flies in the face of Christianity because the Messiah taught us to be peaceable, peaceable people. He taught us to not be violent people, to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. I've never seen a dove kill nothing. Never even heard about it. He set the example by laying his life down on our behalf. Even when it's, when it's Followers wanted to fight for him, he wouldn't let them. So where do they get off slaying thousands upon thousands upon tens of thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people in the name of Christianity? That should tell you right there, something wrong with that Christianity. If your form of Christianity contradicts scripture, then you need to look at your Christianity. You don't discount scripture. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and if, and if a man is in front of you telling you that, hey, this is how I go and it contradicts scripture, believe scripture. I don't care if it's this man speaking to you now or any other man that come along. Follow scripture. That's the problem. That's, that's how we got to this place. That's how we inherited all these lies and these useless traditions. And I'm going to tell you, if you add up all these worldly holidays, that the world make exception for. Mm -hmm. And you add up all the feast days that y'all tell you to keep, mm -hmm. they'll be just about even. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, you know, the, the world may give you, uh, <laughs> you may have to work harder following y'all than you would the world. Because you, you, you probably have some extra days on. <laughs> They, if it wasn't tempting, then it wouldn't be a temptation, now would it? Right. You know, but, you know, this is just the truth of the matter. You know, everybody got to look in the mirror, you know, and they have to, you know, put their Christianity, put their faith, put their walk on the balance, on the balance beam, on the scales, and see if it's found wanting. If it's found wanting, then do something about it. You know, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads up unto life. And few be that find. That's all I have for you today. Hallelujah. Pray it was a blessing to you. Yeah. Yeah.